And so uh, what we're going to do tonight is actually focus on the first two sentences and, and then take a 30,000 kind of view of these, these six chapters, four and a half pages, to just get the core idea. Because spending 15 weeks, you know, like week 10, you'll be like, was there a time when we ever worked in Ephesians? This has been for a long time. But, and so it's easy to get lost um, looking at trees and to miss the forest. And so tonight I, I want to just kind of give an overview of the forest, or the core ideas of, of this letter, because there's really just a few things going on here. That gets filled out in lots of different ways, but it's really just a few things happening. And um, so that's what we're going to do tonight, is kind of fly over the whole possible letter to the Ephesians. But to kind of first let me frame it uh, with why uh, I think this is an important word for us to hear in our place, in our time here at this church. And to do that, um, I want to uh, show you a picture of a man who's definitely not from 21st century Portland, but um, although <laughs> I thought of this, is actually. You might have actually sat next to this man <laughs> this morning at Trump Town, right? It's entirely possible. <laughs> Here in Portland. But uh, so this particular man, however, uh, is not from Portland, though he, he looks like it. Um, he's a Frenchman. He was a Frenchman who lived in the 1800s, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. And uh, if you remember any classes, like from high school or uh, from, from college, uh, you know, like Western Civ or American History or something, he's actually a pretty prominent figure. Uh, in, in modern Western history. So he was a French politician. He was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the French government for in the mid-1800s. Pretty prominent figure. And he, he was utterly fascinated with Amer this, this new democratic experiment called the United States of America. He was fascinated with this thing that was just a few you know, decades old uh, when, when he was born. And so uh, on behalf of the French government, he actually came to the U.S. and he uh, went, he, for a couple of years he lived in a number of cities along the East Coast, with the, kind of the main big cities in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and so on. And he just wanted to absorb as much as he could about American culture and then just write about it to explain it to Europeans. And so this is so interesting, it's public domain, you can go read it online or whatever. He compiled all of his observations and stories and experiences into two volumes, it's just called Democracy in America. And it's just, he has a great wit, a good sense of humor, and then he writes with it. As you'll see, he just has a great way of spot. It's kind of like when you have somebody visit your house or whatever, and you think you're just normal in the way you and your roommates and friends or friendly operate or whatever. And then you have someone come live with you for a while, and they're like, why do you do it that way? You know, why do you do the toilet paper that way? That's screwed up or whatever. So that's kind of like, it was. it's, it's reading about our culture from the perspective of an outsider. And it's almost 200 years old, but as you can see, uh, his comments are still relevant today, I think. And so he's very quotable. He has lots of famous quotes about how strange we are here in America. Uh, and this is one of them, one of his most well-known quotes. <laughs> so he says, the first thing about America that strikes observation is an innumerable multitude of men, all equal in delight, incessantly endeavoring to obtain the petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> That's great. And say it ten times fast. Obtain, incessantly endeavoring. It's just wrote, it's spoke, what a beautifully worded sentence. Incessantly endeavoring to obtain the petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives. He goes on, he says, each of them, living apart, is as a stranger to the fate of the rest. His children and his private friends constitute to him the whole of mankind. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, he touches them, but he does not feel them. Now, let's just keep that up there for a minute. So he's making a couple observations, and, and he thinks they're connected. So first he just says, Americans are like everybody else. They're seeking to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. That's nothing, there's nothing new there. And there's nothing particularly American about that. That's a human thing. <laughs> but what he's saying is that Americans are going about this human task of, of blessing our lives with petty and paltry pleasures <laughs> in a very unique way uh, that he thinks is unique for America. And it's this, this fragmented, disconnected way that Americans go about living their lives. And so... The context of where he's coming from, he's a European, he's writing in the 1800s, right? And so this is right, okay, I barely got out of high school, but I remember a few things about Western, Western Civ class, right? And so 
Europe for a thousand years before this or whatever, it's made up of like fiefdoms, right? Little kingdoms and earls and dukes and peasants and princes and kings, right? And so you have very, very small top tier and the peasantry and people who, you know, they don't even own the land, but they work the land. You have your blacksmiths and your farmers and your sheep farmers and so on. And they basically have to pay and funnel everything to the top, the dudes, the dudes and kings and so on. And so, for the most part, Europe, there are some big cities in Europe, but most of the population is living in small, medium-sized towns and so on. And they have deep roots in these lands. Grandpa worked the farm, great-grandpa worked the farm, great-great-grandpa worked the farm, was a blacksmith, you inherit the family business, these types of very traditional, slow-moving, rooted society. And America comes onto the scene at the birth of the urban industrial age. And so you have, you have America, he's fascinated with it. You have all these first-generation immigrants right off the boat, and so they're already disconnected from their ancient ancestral lands and their people and so on. And then their names all get butchered at Ellis Island, right? And so, and so that happens. And then they end up being thrust into, you know, these big, you know, virgin and growing American cities. And, you know, they, they, they may or may not know anybody. Um, they may or may not know, the, like, the language or learn English yet. And so it's just a melting pot. And so basically, America becomes this society of people disconnected from their roots. And it, it's the melting pot. And so you have, yes, of course, it's the great, the great story that everybody in theory is coming for is the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? The dream. But the way we're going about that is exceptionally disconnected with shallow roots from our family. And basically, what constitutes community or family is your immediate family, your kids, and your private friends. And we look at that and we think, yeah, that's normal. But yeah, that's not normal. Like, that's actually not... The way we live and think about community and that we move, like, far away from our families for a job or for school or something, like, that's not how most humans have lived for most of human history. And it has a deep effect on us, this disconnectedness and this fragmented nature of American society. We're going about the same thing humans have been about for a long time, but we're doing it especially with shallow roots. And dis that's what Tocqueville's saying. Now, this sounds, this sounds like it could have been written yesterday. You know what I'm saying? This is like prophetic. Well, this is almost 200 years ago that he was here making these observations. And American culture has not changed at all. It's only become more so. And so, essentially, it's the idea that human beings, if we don't have something larger to live for than your own self, than your own story, and your own pursuit of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, he sees us as a huge weakness of our culture. And that's not just a whatever, a, a 19th century Frenchman making that observation. This is actually an observation that the scriptures have been making for thousands of years. Is that when human beings don't have anything larger than themselves, their own lives and dreams and aspirations to live for, there's no common story bringing us together. We tend to rot and wither from the inside. It's not good for us. And so, actually, I can't think of a better description even though it's 200 years old, almost, of 21st century Portland. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, petty and paltry pleasures. What a, what a wonderful way to describe what most of us spend our day doing. <laughs> petty and paltry pleasures. It's a perfectly brewed cup of coffee, you know, and the, the certain shrimp skimpy, and this kind of from the food cart down. You know what I mean? This kind of thing. And so, I mean, so here's what's interesting, is that the individual pursuit of the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, that, that can have huge benefits in a society. And just think of Portland. Portland's a city that has exalted the self-expression and the self-realization of the individual. It's like our highest value as a city, right? And so, you know, it's just that thing of like, don't tell me what to do, I'll make it myself, you know, stick it to the man kind of thing, you know? And so you don't like the music you hear, like make your own music and start a new music fest in your backyard or whatever, you know, find a shop in your like camper in your driveway. <laughs> and it's just like, do it yourself. Make your own dip. You don't like the way culture is or just like, like make your own thing. You don't like the chicken or the eggs or whatever you get it at the store. Then like raise your own in your apartment with the people next door. This is Portland, you know? And part of that is precisely because we're, we're skeptical of institutions and traditions and things that we just kind of make, it, make the new thing. It's the new creative do-it-yourself thing. And it has huge benefits. It means great food, fewer chain restaurants. Here in Portland, great food, you know, because it's people inspired and they're not 
down to the, that way of making the food. We'll do the try this way, this way, and make. You know what I'm saying? And so that's a wonderful upside of this whole thing. The downside of a city that exalts self-realization and self-expression as our highest value is you end up with the people who, like Tocqueville is saying, are pursuing life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but we live as strangers to the rest of the fellow citizens who are not maybe our immediate family or, or private, private friends. It's as if we're all pursuing our own little dream worlds, choosing to coexist alongside each other, but really we're actually quite ignorant about the well-being of most of the people around us. <laughs> and we don't really care, because that's not our highest value. Our highest value is life, liberty, and pursuit of my little dream to make records and sell them out of my driveway or something. You know, like that's, that's our city. And so it's the same critique that, uh, that Tocqueville offers is exactly the critique that's, that's offered of our, of our culture, culture, too. And so you get a huge flourishing of arts and culture, but you end up with a city of people who are terribly lonely and terribly disconnected from each other and who don't have relational roots that go deeper than a year or two years of a kickball club and my xylophone club or whatever. You know, we have these, but these are not the ties that bind people together for all of life, who will lay down everything for each other's well-being. It's not probably going to happen in your kickball league, you know. And so you, you have people reinventing themselves in new ways of organizing themselves in communities. And, uh, you know, the church is no different. This is what Josh was talking about last week, right? And even Christians in a city like Portland who become connoisseurs or critics of a given church community and can't go to that season or this and that kind of because it kind of fit this, I'm going, I have those friends here, but then I'll, you know what she did to me? No way, and then I'm not going there anymore. And so, it just, we just kind of fit right in as a Christian culture in the city like that. And, and what, what Ephesians is going to, week after week, call us to, is that what we have essentially done is we've taken our core values and made the story of the church and the community of Jesus people fit our values. And what the book of Ephesians is going to give us, is tell us a different story. And tell us that the church does not exist to help you pursue your dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The church exists as this strange, wonderful collection, this new family that God is building around Jesus, and that we're called to submit our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness to Jesus, and now for the benefit and the well-being of others around me, in this new, in this new family. And so this speaks a very relevant word to us, because to people who have nothing larger than themselves to live for, we rot and we wither. And Ephesians is telling us a story and calling us to bind our lives together towards something much greater than, than any one of us. And so I'm super excited, and uh, it's Ephesians. How are you guys doing? Yeah, Alexis well, de Tocqueville. Some of you are like, I did see that haircut today. <laughs> you probably and you probably did. So let's uh, why don't you, let's look at page one, uh, chapter one of Ephesians. We're gonna look at a couple things right at the beginning, and then blaze trail over the whole of these four and a half pages, and uh, uh, mark some takeaways here. Uh, first word of the letter to the Ephesians. What is it? Paul. Paul. So let's just stop. Let's just stop. <laughs> so Paul. So. Some of you guys already know about this guy. Some of you know kind of of him. You're reading the Bible again for the first time. Some of you are like, okay, he's, he authored 13 letters in the New Testament, but that's about, that's about it. So Paul is this uh, individual's Greek and Roman name. It's a, it's a man who went by two names. His Greek and Roman name is Paul. His uh, Hebrew Jewish name is Saul. Saul or Shaul. Paul and Shaul. And he was a man who lived in two worlds after he, after he uh, became a Christian. He, be, uh, he was both a Greek and Roman citizen and a mover and a shaker in that world, but he also he was a, a Jewish rabbi who became convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the King of Israel and the Lord of all humanity and the Lord of the world. So look how he describes himself. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, there's a whole story back here about what, the, what on earth that means. So, apostle is one of those funny Bible words where it's just a Greek word uh, spelled with English letters. And it just means one who's sent, one who's sent on behalf of somebody else. And so, he sees himself as an official, like, ambassador, like Tocqueville on behalf of 
France to America, but here, to him, to the, to the world of non-Jewish people on behalf of Christ, Christ Jesus. Now, what is, is going on there? So, it's a brief kind of story. Some of you know the story, some of you don't. Some of you need, need a refresher. So, uh, did he begin life uh, with a happy face when he thought about Jesus? Absolutely not. Absolutely, just the opposite, actually. So he was born around the same time as Jesus, and he was, uh, he was educated, you know, in Jerusalem, and he was uh, a rabbi, and he identified himself as a Pharisee, which means that he was part of an influential kind of religious teacher group uh, that, that gave their lives to the study of the Hebrew Scriptures. And they saw it as their kind of mission to the people of Israel to call them to allegiance uh, to Yahweh, the God of Israel, who redeemed them from slavery in Egypt, and so on. And so he was deeply dedicated uh, uh, to the God of Israel and to, and to the scriptures. And so this Jesus comes onto the scene, and he's really ticked off about this guy, because this guy comes around claiming to, to represent Yahweh, the God of Israel, like directly, like I and the Father are, are one. He claimed to be the God of Israel walking around in the flesh. Jesus claimed that the interpretations of the Hebrew Scriptures that the Pharisees had were, were wrong, or at least some like only half right, and Jesus challenged their interpretation. And not only that, Jesus ended up being crucified by the Romans, which is just a surefire sign that you failed. <laughs> if you're dead on the cross at the hands of the Romans, whatever you were trying to do, it didn't work out for you very well. And so that's his view of Jesus. He's a failed Messiah. He's clearly cursed by God because he ended up on the cross, and he's a failure. And so these, these Jesus followers go around thinking that the cross was actually not a failure, but actually Jesus' victory over death, along with his resurrection. And they go around like telling people he's the Messiah. And Paul's like, this is dangerous, this is a perversion of the Hebrew Scriptures, and we need to do everything in our power to stamp this thing out. And that's exactly what he said he was going to do. This is Paul later talking about how much he hated it. Uh, the Jesus movement and Jesus. He said, I was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote. Again, he was part of conspiracy to murder of many, of many Christians. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. And so on one occasion, uh, he was headed from uh, Jerusalem up north to a city that's now in Syria, engulfed in the civil war that's going on there right now, the city of Damascus. And uh, lo and behold, who uh, should he meet on the road as he's going up to Damascus? <laughs> But he meets Jesus. And he's like, ooh, that's not going to go well for this guy. <laughs> and so uh, Jesus, he's just there. And he confronts. He confronts this man. And he says, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> you're on the wrong side, man. You're on the wrong side. Why are you persecuting me, he says. Not why are you persecuting my people. He says, you're persecuting my people. Why are you persecuting me? And so uh, he confronts him and... Uh, all of a sudden, Paul realizes he was just dead wrong. Everything dead wrong about who Jesus was and everything that happened. He's blinded by the whole experience. So he has to go into this, into this city, and Jesus then appears to this other, one of his followers, a guy named Ananias, and says, hey, Paul just entered the city. Go talk with him. And Ananias is like, no way. Like, he's going to kill me. You know? He's pretty sure this is the guy. Are you sure, Jesus? You have the wrong guy. He's like, no, it's exactly the right guy. You need to go talk to him. And so he goes and talks with Paul, and for three days, he doesn't eat and drink. He's just tripping out about everything that's happened. And then he realizes, like, oh my gosh, Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified, that guy who was crucified by the Romans, he's the Messiah. Like, he's the God of Israel come among us to do everything that he promised he would do in the Hebrew Scriptures. And so he has this huge turnaround, and he goes from persecutor to proclaimer of, of the good news about Jesus. That's the story that's underneath this whole first sentence right here. Paul, an official sent representative by Christ Jesus. Now, just a side note here. Is Christ, here Jesus Christ, is Christ Jesus' his last name? Okay, so remember that one. Remember, that's just to help He was not born to um, Joseph Christ. <laughs> or Mary Christ. That's not, okay, there's Tim Mackey. 
but not Jesus Christ. It doesn't work like that. So Christ, nobody called Jesus Christ, a handful of people did before his death and resurrection, and they really didn't grasp what they were saying. Christ is a title that was applied to Jesus by the Christians, early Christians, after Jesus rose from the dead. And it means king. It means anointed, messianic king. And so when we read this, and as we go through Ephesians, just as kind of a help to me, uh, just to refresh our memories, help us see it with new eyes, uh, I'm just going to say king when we come across Christ, because that's what it means. So I'm, I'm Paul, I'm an official sent ambassador on behalf of King Jesus, by the will of God. And I'm guessing he's not really, like, guessing on that. Like, you know, we are, some of us, we're trying to figure out God's will, should I move to this place, or take that job, or marry that person, what's God's will, and so on. But he, like, shows up, he blinds you, he heals you, he speaks to you directly. You're not really guessing on that one. You know what I mean? So he's just, like, really clear, I'm definitely an apostle by the will of God, right? And not his will, because he was trying to kill Jesus all. So, here we have, he introduces uh, himself with his story. An apostle of King Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in King Jesus. Now, here's a good survey. Everybody look down close at the word, uh, look at verse 1, and look at um, the words in Ephesus. And just, I'm curious, by a show of hands, how many of you have a little footnote? Some little footnote by the words in Ephesus right there. Okay, a good number of you, and look down at that little footnote. And what does that footnote tell you? I'm a fan of footnotes. They're cool. So what does that say? It says some early manuscripts don't have those two words in Ephesus. And that's true. It's super interesting. So actually the earliest, a handful of the earliest copies of, of the letter to the Ephesians just don't have that. It just reads, to God's holy people, to the faithful, in King, in King Jesus. Now here's what's very interesting, is that if you read uh, the rest of Paul's mail to the other churches, um, it's very clear, like he, to the churches that were full of people that he, he personally started these churches, he often like talks to people like, hey, so-and-so, say hi to them, and hey, you, stop doing that, or hey, I heard that's happening, it's really rad, good job. He is often talking to personal individuals, in the, like Corinthians or Philippians and so on. And what people have noticed for a long, long time about Ephesians is Ephesians doesn't like mention any individual in the church. It doesn't seem like he's responding to any problem at all in the church. Um, Ephesians, more than any of Paul's other letters, reads like an essay that's written to Christians in general, summarizing Paul's kind of whole vision of the gospel and the story of it, what, everything of what he's about. And so uh, what, what many people think has happened, could be wrong, could, could be right, I kind of think it's right, is that uh, this letter actually began as a letter to multiple different churches in a region where Paul did a lot of uh, church planting. And it's odd because he spent a lot of time in Ephesus and knows these people very, very closely, but he doesn't mention any of them. And so likely this is a letter Paul wrote while he was in prison to a whole group of churches to remind them, uh, churches in the region of Ephesus, to remind them about him, his story, and summarize everything that he, he was about. And the copies that got multiplied the most were the copies that arrived at the city of Ephesus. Does that make sense? And they got copied and recopied, and therefore it's the letter to the Ephesians. But if it was the letter to the Laodiceans, too, maybe that would, that's what it would have been called. Anyway, you guys get the point of what's going on here. So it's not like this isn't a big problem, but it does help illuminate why the letter reads differently than Paul's, Paul's other letters. And I know there are like four of you that found that interesting, but I just wanted to tell you, tell you that anyway. Okay, so, so he's writing to the church as, as a whole, I think, in, in the region. And so he goes on, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus the King. So grace is the core part of his message, the good news. It's going to be, big, play a big role in chapter 2, along with peace. Two things that flow out of, of the cross and the resurrection. And who does the peace come from? Does it come from God or from Jesus? Exactly, exactly, that's exactly right. So, and this gets you into the vision of God in Paul's, all of Paul's letters and, and Paul's letters to the Ephesians. In other words, he doesn't see God and Jesus as two separate things, but he does see them as distinct but crucially interrelated with one another. And so what is happening here is the roots 
of what we now call the Trinity. God's vision, uh, Paul's, and it's not Paul's vision, it's just the way Jesus talked about himself. That God was the Father, so we can call him our Father, just like Jesus did, but yet Jesus and the Father are one. Explain that to a two-year-old, and uh, just go for it, just try. <laughs> so, I've been thinking, my son's two now, and I'm like, I'm not even going to go there. Yeah, right now Jesus is just the good guy who makes people's lives better when he comes into contact with them. That's my son's conception of Jesus right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to share that with him. I think that's great. We'll get to the Trinity when he's 14. <laughs> so anyway, but this is, this is crucial because, and this is, Josh talked about this last week, is that as, as Christians, Paul had his whole view of God reworked around Jesus. He had read the Hebrew Scriptures, he had a vision of who God was, but then he encountered Jesus and like, whoa, that scrambled everything. And so he actually says that he had to go into the desert for three years just to sit and just, what I think, likely pray and reread his Bible and re-envision his whole concept of God uh, around Jesus. And so God is who Jesus is to us. And for us, that is, that is God. Okay, that's a separate thing. So he introduces himself, who he's writing to, grace and peace, from this particular God, the God revealed to us in Jesus. Okay, you guys ready for the overview? 3,000 feet. We've got, you're like, what? We've already started. Like, no, we're just getting warmed up here. Okay. Okay, so we're just, here's the dump truck. It's going to just unload on you right now. So he begins with this beautiful poem of praise that Josh is going to help us explore next week. And so it begins here in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to go on to talk about all of the things that we should thank God for. And he's going to kind of wrap up the whole story of what God is up to in Jesus, in the past, in the present, and in the future. And he boils it all down, the center of this little poem right here. Look at verses 9 and 10. And these are some core ideas. If you get these ideas, the rest of the letter just kind of falls into place. So look at verse 9. He says, God has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in the king, in Christ. In other words, God has been working out his purposes throughout history, and Jesus, the king, King Jesus, he's the crucial linchpin for the unfolding of everything, of what life is about, and human existence, and why the cosmos exists in the first place. And so this is what he says, it's the mystery that's, that's been made known now. And what is that? What's that purpose of God in Christ? He says, verse 10, it's to be put into effect when the times were just right to reach their fulfillment. And here it is. Here's the, God's purpose. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth in, in Christ, in the King. Some of your translations have to summarize or sum up everything in heaven and earth in, in Christ, the King. Okay, so two things going on here. That little word there, to sum up or bring unity... Um, it was a Greek word that I'm going to write up here because it's awesome. That's why. So uh, it's, the, it's the Greek word anakephalio. Anakephalio. Would you say it with me? Very good, class. Very good. Uh, so Greek words, like a lot of English words, are kind of are made up of compound elements, multiple elements. And so... Um, ana just means up, and this, this uh, kephala is the Greek word for head. And head has uh, the same kind of role in Greek as the way it does in English. So we might say, oh yeah, like she's going to head up that project, or things reach ahead. So it's, uh, it's essentially a way of saying to sum up, or to unify, to bring everything together to the main key point. And so, what is he saying here? He's saying, basically, all of human history, and in fact, the history of the cosmos, reached its key unifying point, the purpose to which everything was moving, and all was summarized and unified and brought together in, in Jesus. Now, that's a fairly astounding claim. I hope you wouldn't say that about just anybody. You know what I mean? Like, you know, my neighbor, the whole universe finds its purpose in him. You know, that's a really strange thing to say about somebody. It's, it's a really crazy claim to make. And this is essentially what's, what's underneath it, is that if the whole universe needs unifying and to be brought together, what's 
Underneath, underneath it is the assumption that the universe in humanity is a deeply fragmented, disconnected thing. Hmm. Hmm. Right? Not like what Cookville was talking about. People living as strangers to the rest, to the fate of, of their neighbors. And so you have a world where everything's disconnected and fragmented for lots of different reasons that he's going to talk about, but that in Jesus, the King, JC, in Jesus, the King, everything is being brought together to, to rediscover its purpose, to rediscover how everything and everyone is connected and all of this is a story that's going somewhere. That's what he's saying right here. And he uses this word to sum up or to bring to a unifying point everything that's going on. You guys with me here? So this kind of begs the question then, well, what's, like, how did this happen? What's this, like, how is everything, the cosmos, the humans, how does it all get disconnected and fragmented? Um, let's go to chapter 2, shall we, and discover what Paul says about that. Chapter 2. He says, now, as for you all, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So Paul is now focusing in. He said Christ, Jesus, the king, he sums up everything on heaven and earth. He's focusing in on how he's bringing everything on earth here together, specifically humans. And so, what's wrong with humans, according to what Paul says right there? What's his diagnosis? What's wrong with us? We're dead. We're dead. So zombies is not a new fad, you know what I'm saying? The Bible's been talking about zombies for a long time. The living dead. Right from the very beginning of the story. And so here, we need to translate this image into my little drawing that will summarize the whole letter to the Ephesians. Here we go. Okay. So what he's appealing to is the story of the Hebrew Scriptures and how, and how it begins. So you have the story of, we'll just say, this is all humanity. And uh, the story begins uh, with humans, uh, happy face, sad face. How does it begin? Okay, it's very, very important. Very important, right? The story does not begin with Genesis 3. You need to know that. Very important. <laughs> so, but what happens? Um, obviously, humans have this opportunity to partner with God as a reflect God's image. And what do we do with the thing? You know, we run the whole thing into the ground. So this is my little crash, little comic book kapow or whatever. And so through our uh, decision for autonomy and moral independence from the wisdom of the Creator, what happens is humanity then fragments into a million little stories of everybody seeking life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, maybe just ignoring or apathetic towards other people, maybe even at the expense of other people. And so, if I could draw seven billion little lines right here, this would be the Bible's, the Bible's vision of humanity, disconnected from ourselves, from God, and from other people. And so Paul uses the metaphor of this as like, we're living, we're alive, we're here, you know, you can feel our pulse and we're breathing, but we're dead. There's something that's died inside of us that's fundamental to who we are. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're aware of that fact. We all, and so Paul connects it to what he calls transgression and sin. So transgression, um, so it's great. In a month, Josh Garrel is going to unlock uh, Ephesians chapter 2. That's going to be awesome. So, but just to summarize, this is key to his, Paul's diagnosis of the human condition. Is transgressions is intentional moral choices that are wrong. I know this is wrong. I know this is like violating that other person. I know it's not honoring. If I believe in God, the, the God who made me, I know this is wrong in every way. I'm going to do it anyway because I want to. That's transgression. Sin is the Bible's word for failure, moral failure. I'm made for a purpose. I'm made for something more. And yet I continually fail and make choices that just don't, aren't in line at all with who God made me to be, and who I know I'm supposed to be, but I constantly just fail. So. And so we intentionally do wrong, and we just are constantly failing at being human. And this results in a death inside of us. And it's this, it's just this utter awareness, if we're honest with ourselves, that we're just completely bent in on ourselves, or we're bent in on the well-being of just a small little group, my little tribe, 
or as Tocqueville said, right? That, that just their own children and private friends constitute to them the whole of hum humanity. That's such a great line, because that's exactly how Americans live, right? And so it's just we can throw money and technology and education at it, and there's just something so fundamentally broken about us that just the world's a messed up place and nobody can do anything about it. It's like we're dead. We're partially alive, but we're also dead. And so what what is what's the response here? This is the diagnosis of the human condition, and what is Paul's response here? Look at verse four. Again, following his story here, verse four. He says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with the king of Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace that you've been saved. And God raised us up in the king, in Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in King Jesus. Now this is this is crazy. <laughs> I think. It's quite bizarre what he's saying. So so here's how the story of the Bible goes. Is that out of this mess and fragmentation of, of screwed up humans, God chooses one family here. And binds himself to this family in, in a covenant relationship. Who's that family? This, uh, Abraham's family, the people of Israel. And from, and of course, Israel, they're not morally superior than any of the other fragmented, screwed up humans. Um, but they are the family that God chooses by his grace to bring about his fulfillment of his promises. And so from them comes JC, King, King Jesus. Right, the Jewish, the Jewish Messiah, and what Paul is essentially saying here is that Messiah, Jesus, King Jesus, he was specifically the Messiah of Israel, but that was never the point. Is that he's just a tribal, national king of Israel? What Jesus came to do was something for all of sinful, dead, broken humanity. It's as if this is that summarizing, that uniting of all things. In Jesus. And so Paul's vision of Jesus here is that Jesus is the one human who actually was the kind of human that God made us all to be, but we continually failed at being because we're dead and so broken in the body. And so Jesus' life was lived on our behalf. Jesus' death was a death on our behalf as he absorbed the collective just train wreck of our stupid decisions and sin and selfishness into himself on the cross. And his resurrection from the dead was also for us and on our behalf. And so Paul's idea is that if you join yourself to, by faith to Jesus, the Messiah, as your king, no matter what human you are, all of a sudden, what's true of King Jesus is now true of you. You may have failed a lot of your life as a human being, but the moment you grab onto Jesus by faith, his life now belongs to you and is counted towards your life. His death is now in place of your death, and his resurrection life is now available. That's what he says here. I mean, some of us are like, God who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ. And we're like, really? Maybe? I don't remember. I think I would remember something like that. <laughs> and Paul would say, yeah, totally. Remember your baptism, right? Which symbolized the moment of you being immersed into his death and being raised from the dead along with him when you embraced him by faith. Apparently, verse 6, God raised us up with the king and seated us in the heavenlies. And you're like, I'm sure I would remember something like that. That sounds like a science fiction movie. And Paul's like, yeah, that already happened. That happens every time you open yourself to Jesus' presence through the Spirit in your life, and you make steps of growth and change, and you actually allow God to, to make you into a new kind of human. You're, you're showing your true identity and this new family that you belong to. We'll get to that in a second. So here's the idea. All of humanity is summed up. Jesus is the human. He dies for us. He's raised for us. All of humanity finds its purpose and, and healing potential and our new future in him. You guys with me? Okay, now, look what he does next. This is very interesting. This is kind of the last half of chapter 2, and he gets into 3 here. Look at verse 11. He's going to move towards the issue that most of us did not wake up thinking about. But it, which is really important. He says, therefore, remember that you who are Gentiles by birth. What's a Gentile? 
Uh, just a non-Jewish person. You who are Gentiles by birth, and you're called uncircumcised by those who call themselves a circumcision. That's what's done in the body by the human hands. Remember that at that time, you were separate from the king, from King Jesus. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. So in other words, this was a burning issue in the first decades of the Jesus uh, movement. So you have Jesus comes as a Jewish Messiah, but you have all these people who aren't Jewish who are hearing about Jesus and they're like, yeah, I want in. Like, I want this Jesus. And they're embracing him by faith. And so the question becomes raised, well, he's the Jewish Messiah, so do I need to become Jewish to become a follower of the Jewish Messiah? This is a huge uh, hotbed of dispute. And you read the book of Acts and it's a big focal point there. And so, um, by the guidance of the Spirit, the leaders of the early church discerned that, no, if you're not Jewish, you don't have to start eating kosher or following the Sabbath every Friday night. And if you're an adult male and you want to become a follower of Jesus, you don't have to get circumcised, which is great, great news. <laughs> really great news <laughs> to have to not do that as an adult. And so essentially what they said is Jesus was like the human who made his grace available to all nations. And so what happens is, look at what he says here. This is where it is. Okay, look down at verse 14. He says, He himself, Jesus himself, he's our peace. He's made the two groups, Jewish and non-Jewish, he's made them one. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. All clear on that one? There? You're like, what? What did he just say? I don't know what he just said. We'll get to that in a moment. Here's what his purpose. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God. Now here, here's, the, here's the point of what he's saying. Is that you have fragmented humanity, humanities, human tribes, people, individuals, nations, cultures, all living, pursuing their private dreams of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sometimes in competition with each other, at expense with each other. And what he's saying essentially is that at the cross, all of that gets dealt with and reconciled. And so what happens is through this, what God is doing is bring, creating a people who pass through the cross and come out the other side. And God's purpose is to create, what does Paul say? What does he call them right here? He says it's a new humanity. It's a new, a new family that no longer defines its identity by what tribe you belong to, or even what little niche subculture you belong to, or what size jeans you wear, you know, or what kind of, do you listen to vinyl, or you know, do you download it all, do you listen to Spotify, oh my gosh. But yeah, so there's, you know, like, what humans do is we by nature divide ourselves and define our identity by the little subgroups that we create. And in America, or Portland, we like multiple, we just like turn the volume up to 11. You know what I'm saying? On the little knit subcultures that we create. And we're all creating, it's all these little subcultures in Portland, and everybody's climbing a social ladder, shows social hierarchy, and it's like you get snobbed out for like wearing a particular kind of shoe or something like that. You're like, really? You're going to define your identity and have, like what you think about yourself by the kind of shoes you wear. But you do it all the time. You judge people by what they wear. You know what I'm saying? We all do it. And so this is just our American way of doing it, which Tocqueville said was extra screwed up. Right? But the but humans have been doing this all, all along. And so here's, here's what Paul's getting at, is that in this new family, all of us stand on just level ground before the cross. And so Jew, Gentile, Irish, Scottish, the two kinds of Irish, right, Northern Ireland, so on, that whole thing, Jew, Palestinian, right, black and white, whatever the ethnic, so slave or free, in, Rome, in you know, Roman culture, or in 200 years ago in America, all these different classes, the way humans carve up and divide humanity into identity and purpose and value. And Paul just says all of that just gets leveled before the cross. Because every human being is dead, every human being needs to be made alive, and we all stand at equal cross, right? Equal, on equal ground right here. And so in this family, we are defined by one thing alone. I'm someone for whom Jesus, King Jesus died, he loved me, he gave his life for me, and he's giving me new life every day. That's it. That's the baseline that unites us as a family. And so, 
what happens is a community of people who can come from very, very, very different backgrounds, but all of a sudden have a common story. They have something in common that's the most important thing of all, is that my life is no longer my own because of King Jesus who loved me and gave his life for me. And so he's going to go on then in chapter 3 to talk about how this was Paul's unique role was to be an apostle, a sent representative to the Gentiles. That's Ephesians 1 and 2, 3. How you guys doing? Okay, now 4 through 6 will go quicker. But just to observe here, this is not like kind of the American Christianity that, that many of us were exposed to. And so on. And most of us were exposed to a storyline that had to do with an individual who fell from God's grace and then who, like, you know, gets their butt into heaven by saying a magic prayer, right? <laughs> and saying, you're sinner. And then that constitutes for many of us the whole story of what Christianity is about. And the problem with telling the story that way is, first of all, it's not really the way the Bible tells the story, but, but it's, not, it's too small. Because it makes, it, makes the, it makes the gospel not just personal, but it makes it private. And so you get, you know, a group of individualized Christians who are like, it's me and Jesus and my pickup truck and we're just doing life, you know. And the, the church, well, that one, I don't like the music or whatever. And this one, I don't like the way they do home groups or whatever. And so the connoisseurs and critics of the church, they love Jesus, but they can't stand the church. And Paul would say that it's a contradiction. It's a contradiction. Because the whole thing was to create a new family of people who are bound to each other by covenant. Not by race or class or music pre musical preference, but simply by, by the cross. And so this is the grand vision of what Paul, Paul lays out. So look at chapter 4 with me. Look at how he begins chapter 4. All of a sudden this became, this, is a, this entire book is really about, is about the church. What is the church? What is this community of Jesus' followers? Where did it come from and where is it going? And this is where it came from and this is where it's going. Look at what he says in chapter 4. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. If you've given your allegiance to Jesus, you've been called to become a member of this new family here. And so, all of 4 through 6 is about, like, learning the new values of this Jesus-centered family. And you know, like, at Thanksgiving... You know, just like Josh said last week, you don't get to pick the members of your family, um, which is really frustrating sometimes, because for some of you, like Thanksgiving, Christmas is the nightmare that you do not look forward to every year, right? And it's because you didn't get to pick the people who were in your family. And so that's often the way it is in the church. So look what he says. What does it mean to live worthy of his calling, being a part of this new family? Look what he said. Be completely humble. Be gentle. You're probably going to have to be patient and bear with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And what he's talking, this is all back to here. Jesus came to unify humanity in its most basic point and to create the new family that has his love for them at its basis. And so protect this beautiful new thing that God's created in Jesus. Keep the unity of the Spirit. Listen, there's one body. There's one family. There's one spirit of Jesus working to change and transform the memory, members of the family. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, there's just one Lord, Jesus. There's only one faith when we embrace what he did for us. There's one baptism that symbolizes what happened when you believe. There's one God and Father. You get the point. I'm going to stay here. There's just one family. And uh, so he goes on to say, as he explores what this one family is all about, he's going to explore uh, the conduct the new family values um, of this family, and it's not the white picket fence and have 2.6 children or something like that. Right? It's not that at all. Look at verse 17 of chapter 4. He says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now this is kind of crazy, because who's he writing to mostly? Gentiles, non-Jewish people. So he says, don't live as the Gentiles do. And they're like, wait, I am a Gentile. And he's like, no, you are not. <laughs> You're not anymore. You don't belong to Jew or non-Jew. You're a Jesus person. That's what you are. You're a, Je You're a third thing that didn't exist before Jesus. You're this new family here. So don't live according to your old family mindset and values here. And so what, what is the new family values? We'll learn about this. Um, 
But look, about, look down at verse 22. He has some great language here that keys us into his big, big story. Look at verse 22. He says, You all were taught with regard to your former way of life here to put off your old self, the old humanity that's fragmented and screwed up and selfish and dead, is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds to put on this new self that's being created to be like God. It's as if this is Genesis 1 all over again. It's, we need to learn, we need to relearn what it means to be a human. <laughs> we, don't, we think we know what it means to be a human, but what, what this story is saying is we actually don't. We don't. Where we learn to be human is right here in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And so what is this new family all about? He says, it's, it's, it's becoming like God in true righteousness and holiness. So here's, here's what he says here. He says, first of all, I forgot to write this, that this is a family where unity and reconciliation with each other should be one of our highest values. And that the family conduct is all about holiness. That's a popular word in our culture, right? So she's so holy, whatever. She thinks she's so holy. <laughs> so this is, this is actually a negative concept in our culture. This is the Bible's way of talking about being a counterculture, of being a family of people that operates according to a very different countercultural value system. Specifically, as he's going to go on, when it comes to the three great idols of human history, money, power, and sex. And you run all of those three great gods where humans find their identity and spend their energies, and all of them get completely healed and transformed in light of the cross. And that this is a family where we do money and power and sex very, very differently than the, than the world around us. We'll get into that when we get into chapter 4. And look at chapter 5. He gets into the core value here. And this will spin us off and we'll conclude, bring us to our conclusion. Look what he says here in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us. And gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice. To God, what is the core ethic of this new family? He repeated it three times here. <laughs> to love. Love. And it's not the, like, bonk you over your head, you got shot with Cupid's arrow. Love. Love, uh, in the Bible, is, an, is a word of action, not primarily of emotion. Love is <laughs> commitment and actions that I do that... That, that pursue your well-being, regardless of, of how it affects me or whether or not how you respond to me. It's love that's committed to laying down my rights and my agenda to elevating the other, regardless of whether or not they deserve it or even appreciate it. And he says that ethic of love is summarized right here in this moment. He loved me and gave his life for me, even when I didn't deserve it. And so this is... This is the code of the new humanity that God's created. And here's what's great. Is he's going to run through every relationship you can think of. He's going to run through your own personal value system, how you think about sex, money, power. He's going to run through marriage. What does marriage look like in light of this whole new story? It does not look like traditional cracker over marriage, and it does not look like traditional American marriage either. It's completely different in light of the self-giving love of the cross. As husband and wife constantly... Uh, put themselves under the other to exalt and lift the other up. He's going to rethink parenting in light of this. He's going to rethink a key social structure they had in their day, slaves and masters. And he just drops a hand grenade here and in other books, like the book of Philemon, and that it's going to be a rad Sunday. I'm really excited about that one. So he just rethinks every possible configuration and says, this is what it looks like to live, do this relationship in light of the cross. And this is what it looks like to do this in light of the cross. And this is the ethic of our new family, to stay unified around the cross, to seek to become a counterculture to the world around us, and to constantly give up my agenda and rights to seek the well-being of other people. And if we're all doing this, nobody gets squashed. Nobody drops through the cracks. Everybody, everybody gets elevated. And then he wraps it up, of course, that the final culmination is at the return of Jesus, and I'm not going to draw that, because that will be really corny is the, re the return of Jesus, where this new family that he's making is fully completed, becomes completely like Jesus himself at his return in the restored uh, creation, in the new heavens and, and in the new earth. And 
So this is the big story that the past town. Okay, guys. So, so just a few concluding kind of, I think, challenges that we're going to come back to again and again in this book. First of all, this whole book is about the church. And you may be really disenchanted with the idea of church you're here, so there's something going on, right? but you may be, you may be, have been burned or wounded, you're disillusioned, you're jaded with the whole idea of the church. And that's understandable, but it's at least important to recognize that what Paul and what the New Testament is calling us to is not the screwed up version of whatever you have been burned or wounded, or wounded by. The, the New Testament also agrees with critiquing the failures of the church. You guys with me? Sometimes we encounter, we have bad experiences with the church or people in a church, and then we just kind of write the whole thing off, right? As if that, as if, like, we, oh, I did that Christianity thing, and then that allows you to dismiss the whole thing. And it's like, no, like, whatever wrong was done to you, the New Testament also agrees and saying, yeah, that was screwed up. That shouldn't have happened in, this, in the new family of Jesus. But then also, some of us just get selfish and lazy, and we become connoisseurs and critics. And so really, I think the series is going to, challenge us to really like reframe our whole idea of what this what's happening right here. What is this for? And why is it that you shouldn't just be a connoisseur and drop in, you know, whenever it pleases you or whatever? Why is it that we should bind ourselves to each other in a covenant commitment and create ties that bind us together here for the long haul? That's a foreign idea in our culture. But it's exactly what, what Paul's saying. And so it challenges our vision of the church. Personally, all the way back to Tocqueville, it challenges our idea of ourselves. And I just would put it to you this way. When you think about your life, you know, when you leave a room after hanging out with people, you know, what do, what do people think you are all about? You know, what is your life about? What trail are you leaving behind? And people go like, oh yeah, that guy, he was the that guy. Like, what's your deal? And what Tocqueville is saying, and what Paul is saying, is when we don't have anything larger than ourselves to live for, we will, we will slowly rot and wither as human beings. We don't do well when you pursue life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness by yourself. It's just not what we're made for. We're made to do it together, and that's a very difficult, very difficult thing. But if the cross is what unifies us and constantly critiques us and reshapes us, I think it's about the best bet we have going for us, you know, is this thing called the church, the new humanity. And so what's your life about, you know? And are you in a place where you're ready, as we hear the word of Ephesians, to actually figure out what it means for you to pursue whatever you are about, but to do it in total submission to the grace of Jesus for you, and to do it unto the honor and glory of Jesus, and also as a way of serving the family and a way of contributing to what's, what's going on. I have no idea what that means for you, um, but that's, I think that's the challenge that we're going to head towards this fall. So I'm super excited. I think it's evident. <laughs> and uh, I think this is going to be a good, a good word for us to grow up as a church as we enter a new season. Amen?